29th article of the Russian Constitution guarantees an open public administration. Two years ago, my lawyers from St. Petersburg, Team 29, applied to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Moscow for the release of some historical documents. To my surprise, I received some. They are from May 1960, the failed disarmament summit in Paris, the illegal U.S. nuclear tests in the Argentine Patagonia, and Adolf Eichmann, the Nazi war criminal whom the Mossad claims looked for for years, and on May 11, 1960, kidnapped from Buenos Aires and took to Israel. This statement is false, fake news, the mother of all the lies the media has told and still tells. New discoveries in Argentine and Russian archives prove that things went completely differently. The smoking guns, as journalists call irrefutable evidences, are on the table. There were high-ranking members of the government of Argentine President Arturo Frondizi who arrested the war criminal. They put him in a government car with an official plate, says a report of the Argentine intelligence agency. Tragically, historians believed the Mossad's fables without asking for any written evidence. So the embarrassment of an intelligence agency became official history. Almost all of these governments, including the German, Argentine, and the US, adhered to a pact of silence, and their absolute secrecy made falsifications of history possible. In that sense, the new documents from Moscow are a good sign. A beginning, at least. We go back to the year 1958. In Argentina, Arturo Frondizi and his UCRI, the Intransigent Radical Civic Union, had just won the elections after three years of military governance. The party was the leftist split of the traditional UCR. Frondizi was a leftist, a young lawyer working for the International Red Aid, conducted directly from Moscow. He was highly suspicious to the military. Although they had retreated to their barracks, they continued to control what was happening in the government through their intelligence services. The Cold War raged and the Argentine generals were on the side of the United States and President Eisenhower. Nothing happened in the country without the CIA being informed. On the other hand, the president-elect wanted to push back the power of the U.S. oil companies, using the oil revenues for industrial development. Therefore, Fronisi needed technical support and found it in the Soviet Union. In the same year, 1958, his confidant, UCRI deputy José Lisiaga, negotiated a $100 million credit with the Kremlin for the Argentine oil industry. Washington was horrified. Eisenhower worried about the growing Russian influence in South America. The Soviet leader, Nikita Khrushchev, had just scheduled a disarmament summit in Paris in May 1960 to propose a nuclear weapon-free world. The worldwide anti-nuclear movement had great expectations of this proposal, including President Frondizi. Argentina had strongly supported the Soviet aspirations in the United Nations General Assembly. The U.S. government, however, wanted to retain its nuclear arsenal at all costs, but could not say that out loud because the communists were the bad guys. Khrushchev's initiative threatened their armament industry and their technological advance. Thus, the military-industrial complex came up with the idea of using atomic bombs for civilian purposes. And for this, today one would say, crazy idea, Eisenhower sought allies. In February 1960, he visited Argentina. There, too, the military wanted to keep their atomic plans. Therefore, they came up with the project to use nuclear explosives to expose a river mouth in Patagonia. Of course, with a little help from their friends. Frondizi received Eisenhower politely and traveled with him to the idyllic Bariloche for fishing. But he himself supported the Soviet proposal for a nuclear weapon-free world against the explicit will of his own military. Khrushchev wanted to end the Cold War, draw a bottom line under the chapter of National Socialism, and allow a neutral reunification of Germany. 
the thousands of Nazis who fled to South America after the Second World War, should be able to return. Only the ones who were subject of an arrest warrant should be surrendered to their judges. And those were only two, Joseph Mengele and Adolf Eichmann, both residing in Buenos Aires. They lived there under their real names and the protection of the security forces. The Jewish immigrants, who had fled Hitler during the war, knew exactly who lived in their neighborhood, but remained silent. At that time, no one pursued Nazis, least of all the Mossad. The Israeli government negotiated with German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer a huge loan to finance its nuclear program. Interpol considered Nazi war crimes as political acts and refused to participate in the enforcement of arrest warrants. Mengele run a pharmaceutical company in Buenos Aires, and the German embassy kept in touch with the respected businessman. President Frondizi was a staunch anti-fascist who wanted to get rid of the Nazis and, as suggested by Khrushchev, arrest the wanted war criminals. Whom he had to look for, he knew from the extradition requests that the German embassy had unsuccessfully presented in the past, Mengele and Eichmann. He first took the official route and instructed his three intelligence agencies to find their whereabouts. But they played dumb, says a document of the German embassy in Buenos Aires. The three Argentine security agencies reported on the lack of results of their investigations. Since his officials were lying to him, he had to take the matters into his own hands and arrest the war criminals with his people in order to enforce the German arrest warrants in Buenos Aires. Their arrests were to be announced by Khrushchev on May 16th at the disarmament summit in Paris. Where Mengele and Eichmann lived was relatively easy to find out. Eichmann's children went to the German schools under their real names. They had, like Mengele, a legal passport and a job. Adolf Eichmann had already attracted attention in 1954, after his son Klaus harassed a neighbor's daughter, 12-year-old Sylvia Herman. In the same year, General Juan Perón, who had brought thousands of Nazis into the country, was still in power, holding his protective hand over them. The Jewish communities protected their synagogues, kindergartens, and schools from being attacked. Sylvia's father, Lothar, had fled the Nazis in the 30s. Almost his entire family had been murdered in the concentration camps. After the conflict with the Eichmanns, Hermann had to flee again. He left the city with his family and moved south. About the history of the Hermann family, I made the documentary Disinformation, which can be found on YouTube. Frondizi wanted to ensure that the people he had located were really the wanted criminals. After all, one was employed by Mercedes-Benz and the other owned a pharmaceutical firm. The verification was relatively easy. Eichmann had arrived in Argentina in 1950 on the so-called Rat Line with the help of the Vatican. He first worked as an engineer in Tucumán, in the north of the country. In 1960, the governor of Tucumán was Celestino Gelsi, member of Frondizi's UCRI. His right-hand man was Abraham Rosenberg. Él ha sido diputado provincial y ha sido presidente del Banco Municipal, diputado del Partido Radical Intransigente, en la época que presidente era el doctor Frondizi. ¿Usted conoció a Frondizi? Sí, sí. Sí, sí porque yo era chica y le decíamos tío. En 1952, Eichmann applied to the police in Tucumán for an identity card in the name of Clement and had his fingerprints taken. In 1960, they disappeared from the police archive. Someone must have stolen and given them to the future kidnappers. Lydia's father stood under urgent suspicion. Lo que él le reprochaba es que mi papá eh, fue cómplice para ubicarlo y sacarlo, eh, ubicar a Adolfo Eichmann, eh, comprobar eh, su identidad y sacarlo del país. According to the official history, Adolf Eichmann was kidnapped by a command of the Mossad on May 11, 1960, after his work at Mercedes-Benz, and 11 days later, flown out secretly to Israel in an El Al airplane. 
This same history tells that the Paris Disarmament Summit, that took place at the same time, failed on Khrushchev's bad mood because a U.S. spy plane had been shot down two weeks before. I filmed another documentary about it, Craters for Peace, which is also on YouTube. It is certain that a Mercedes-Benz bus dropped Aikman off at 6.20 on a bus station close to the highway, and that from that point he switched to a local bus. Work colleagues told this to the Argentine investigating judge. The Mossad people arrived at about the same time in Buenos Aires with a plane taxi, a piper from Montevideo. This states the flight plan that I found in the archives of the Uruguayan Immigration Agency. The pilot told me that in 1960, he was still in the Air Force, and that after work, this means from the late afternoon, he occasionally flew with this piper to the other side of the Rio Plate. The airplane was exceptionally heavy because of its special equipment and not safe to fly. One cannot compare the Mossad of the 1960 with today's. The agents traveled to the southern hemisphere wearing summer clothes during the winter month of May, and none of them spoke Spanish. What the Israelis did not know was that the plane flew for the CIA and belonged to a standard oil manager. This information was given to me by the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration. The Piper took off from Montevideo and landed in San Fernando, Buenos Aires, a small airport for national flights with no customs or passport controls. But of course, the security authorities checked the landing site and registered who arrived there. Presumably, the dilatatism of the Israelis brought them on track of the kidnappers. The ones who really captured Aikman are named in the document of the Argentine Intelligence Agency. Its records were confiscated after the last military dictatorship and are kept in a memorial in the town of La Plata. Aikman was transported during his abduction in a vehicle of the presidential office with an official plate of the government. From DC's secretary, Samuel Schmuckler, sat at the wheel and took him to the house of Masar Barnett in Akasusu. President from D.C. was up to date on all events. These two men were proven members of the UCRI. Masar Barnett headed the central bank. The other people who had been involved in the operation are not mentioned in the document. But it's highly unlikely that Frondizi would have wanted to put the operation just in the hands of the very inexperienced Mossad people. Governor Helsi was in Buenos Aires just at that time. Surprisingly, he came back to Tucumán on the evening of May 23rd on an official airplane. He had been in the capital city for a national holiday, he told a reporter. But the holiday was on the 25th, two days later, the journalist asked. He just did not feel well, was the short answer. Aikman's sons announced the disappearance of their father on May 12th, a short time later, the police intervened. The Israelis and Aikman landed in custody. One of the Mossad's agents was injured during the arrest. Estaba un poco confundido, tenía sueño y indiqué las cosas corrientes, los exámenes corrientes y al día siguiente volví a verlo. Yo hacía mis recorridas por la mañana, ya no estaba. Eh, lo habían embarcado de regreso a Israel junto con él. In the eyes of the military, Frondizi and his people had committed a criminal offense. The head of state had brought foreign security officers into the country without parliamentary approval in order to take a hostage without the police. For the CIA, that was just what they were waiting for, days before the opening of the Paris Disarmament Summit. The Argentine military, affiliated with them now, had the whole group of hostage takers and the hostage in their hands and became hostage takers themselves. CIA head Alan Dulles had already informed Eisenhower's national security advisor, Gordon Gray, about the events on May 11th, the abduction day. The U.S. government keeps that document secret until today. 
The CIA did what it did a year before, capturing two Russian agents while Khrushchev campaigned for a nuclear weapon-free world at the General Assembly of the United Nations. This is written in a protocol of the U.S. National Security Council. Before the opening of the Paris summit, the CIA informed Khrushchev that his plan had failed completely and that his allies, the Frondizi government and the Israelis, were in custody in Buenos Aires. Their fate now depended on him. He was advised to renounce his proposal for a nuclear weapon-free world and the reunification of a neutral Germany. Of course, Khrushchev was bursting with anger. He had wanted to announce in Paris the arrest of a wanted Nazi, war criminal, and completely underestimated the United States, an ally during World War II. This comes from a document of the German Federal Intelligence Service, BND, that I got through a lawsuit. Another document now released by the Russian Foreign Ministry confirms that. On May 16, four days after the kidnapping, Marisa Lisiaga arrived at the Soviet embassy in Buenos Aires at 10.30 a.m. Two years earlier, her husband, José Lisiaga, obtained a million-dollar loan from the Soviet Union. She came unannounced, at her request, the document says. The Lisiagas were both members of the UCRI and Frondizi's closest confidants. The president, according to the document, wanted to receive Comrade Kosin as soon as possible. His Minister of Internal Affairs would also be present at the interview. On May 19, another secret talk between Russian diplomats and the mayor of Buenos Aires, Hernán Giral, also a UCRI member, took place. Alexei Kosin, Deputy Soviet Prime Minister, flew in and discussed the situation during a dinner with Frondizi and his minister Rogelio Frigerio, previously a member of the communist group Insurrexit. The report of that conversation has not been released yet. Under these conditions, of course, the summit in Paris, as expected by the Eisenhower administration, ended with no results. Therefore, the CIA had no more interest in Eichmann. The Argentine military wanted to get rid of him. In the meantime, the Israeli foreign minister had arrived officially for a holiday, and he and his Argentine counterpart agreed in treating the case confidentially and not to strain the relations between Tel Aviv and Buenos Aires. The already mentioned document of the Argentine secret agency speaks of a treaty. Legally, Eichmann should have been extradited to Germany because the arrest warrant had been issued by the Frankfurt Public Prosecutor's Office. But in Frankfurt was working General Prosecutor Fritz Bauer, exiled during the National Socialism. So, Eichmann was deported to Israel. There, he arrived under the highest secrecy on May 23rd. The Israeli government's decision to announce his arrest and bring him to court has less to do with justice, but with the horrible consequences of U.S. nuclear testing in Patagonia. The world public was served the story of the heroic abduction performed by the Mossad. Of course, Eichmann's sons knew that this was not true and sought revenge. A bomb exploded 100 meters from Frondizi's house, and the Rosenberg family also feared for their lives. Yo hacía de secretaria de mi papá cuando no estaba en la escuela y entonces atendía el teléfono y le dejaba los mensajes cuando él no estaba. En una de esas me llaman, me pregunta si estaba mi papá. Yo le digo que no, que si quiere dejar algún mensaje. ¿Y quién hablaba? Me dijo que hablaba Adolf Eichmann y que... Eh, y me preguntó, ¿usted es la hija? Sí, ¿es la hija mayor? Sí. Bueno, el mensaje es que la vamos a secuestrar. Y yo pensé que era una broma. Le dejaban lo, los amigos de mi papá, tampoco tenía idea quién era Adolf Eichmann. Y bueno, cuando vino mi papá le di el mensaje. Fue una desgracia porque desde ese año, yo sí, 12, porque iba al último grado del primario y todo ese año y todo primer año del secundario, me llevaban y me traían de la escuela, no podía ir con mis amigas, había eh, gente, policías en la puerta de mi casa. Y, y por conversaciones que escuchaba, parece que él había recibido otras amenazas. At home, her father never talked about the subject. Later, Lydia learned 
that a certain Ezequiel Avila Gacho had accused her father in Parliament of stealing Eichmann's fingerprints from the police archive. This man was a dazzling figure, warning repeatedly of a Jewish Sionist world conspiracy. But he had the best connections to the military. Avila Gacho was arrested for his assertion for 30 days. Later, he filed a criminal complaint against Rosenberg for high treason and requested to investigate the disappearance of the fingerprints. The procedure dragged on for years. In 1971, Rosenberg took his own life and the investigation was stopped. Justamente el doctor Celestino Gelsi fue que nos avisó que ya estaba el, el juicio terminado a favor nuestro. My lawyers from St. Petersburg applied for declassification of the remaining documents from the Russian Foreign Ministry. I have asked Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov to make the decision himself and not to leave it to his bureaucrats, who always vote for secrecy. In Buenos Aires, I expect a decision from the administrative court. I had requested publication of the agreement between Israel and Argentina, as well as the still secret messages. In the public archives of the Argentine Foreign Ministry, I found a list of these dispatches so I can prove their existence. I asked for a conversation with the head of the Middle East Department and took my lawyer and a notary with me, who prepared an official document on the meeting. The diplomat remained stubborn. He did not have these documents, could not help me. In 2018, I filed a lawsuit requesting the interrogation of several witnesses, including the archivist from La Plata and the ministry. Una testigo eh, muy importante a mi juicio fue precisamente una funcionaria de la propia Cancillería que trabaja en el archivo de la misma del Ministerio y que reconoció que había información a la cual ella no tenía acceso. O sea, eh, si bien trabaja en el archivo histórico, no toda la información que, 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 que maneja la Cancillería está en ese recinto y por lo tanto dejó en evidencia que hay, hay eh, informaciones que, que escapan a su, a su ámbito. Pero reconoció que los documentos que yo entregué son de ahí. Asimismo, reconoció, así efectivamente reconoció que esos documentos son de ahí de Cancillería. I also asked the Israeli government for a release of the Eichmann records. There is no reason for maintaining secrecy while the Mossad is trumpeting its alleged heroic role in the kidnapping around the world. But the Prime Minister's office told my Israeli lawyer that there are still secret documents available, but their release would jeopardize national security. También está la, la señora Perla Klein, que es una traductora de hebreo de muchos años de, de, de trayectoria y que entregó importante información relativa a cómo se maneja el gobierno de Israel en términos de, de, de las cuestiones procedimentales y que corroboran lo que nosotros planteábamos en la, en la demanda. También eh, prestó testimonio una funcionaria del Archivo de la Memoria de la Plata, que eh, institución eh, pública que entregó también información, información relevante que, eh, que emplaza, permite emplazar a la Cancillería en el sentido de, de, de confrontar esa información que ellos tienen con la información que la Cancillería dice eh, no tener. My lawyer is a law professor and president of the Argentine Association of Foreign Correspondents. The access to official documents is important for all journalists seeking serious reporting, the best weapon against fake news. Therefore, the association supports my request. La Cancillería ofreció como único testigo a este ministro y este, este funcionario um, en su testimonio que fue escrito, fue un testimonio que él no fue, no fue a, a declarar al juzgado como los demás porque constaba de la prerrogativa sin perjuicio de que no lo informaron en su momento como debieron haberlo hecho. Eh, este ministro al interrogatorio escrito que nosotros le enviamos eh, y al que la abogada de Cancillería se opuso varias veces por lo que hubo que reformularlo, este testigo eh, reconoció también siendo ministro de la Cancillería que... Eh, había áreas también que él no tenía, a las cuales no tenía acceso y que documentación que él desconocía. According to the witness, he has access to documents with the level of secrecy, confidential and only for official use, but not to secret papers, and certainly not to those from the year 1960. The UCRI no longer exists. 
Today's UCR, which was in government until the beginning of December 2019, has not responded to my request to comment on the historical events and the role of President Frondizi. The smoking guns are on the table. I have a whole arsenal of journalistic revolvers and there is no doubt about their authenticity. But presumably Hollywood will continue to produce pathetic dramas by presenting a CIA gangster operation as a noble Mossad action. And probably television and newspapers will remain silent instead of admitting to have participated in falsifying history. Khrushchev's initiative for a worldwide disarmament of nuclear weapons in 1960 was the first serious proposal of a government with atomic potential. And until today, that never happened again. The world is full of weapons of mass destruction and politicians continue to lie to their people, keeping their archives secret. Thank you.